Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Nina Samosco. She, of course, played Corey Haim's twin sister in the 1988 cult classic License to Drive, which is quite perfect because uh, we just had that Corey documentary uh, released uh, a week ago. And, of course, she's the sister of Casey Samosco, star of Back to the Future, Stand By Me, Secret Admirer, Three O'Clock High, so many great movies. And I'm having her on the show today to talk about her career, movies like License to Drive, Tucker, The Man in His Dream. She was also on Lonesome Dove. Um, God, she's done a lot of good stuff. Little Noises, Wild Orchid 2, lots of great work. And uh, she's also a survivor of lupus, and I'm going to ask her about that as well. And she teaches yoga. I'm hoping this will be a pretty entertaining show, you know, in this difficult time of the coronavirus. I just hope all of you, you know, just never give up hope and that all of you will just face the fact that we will beat this because we will. And... This country is strong, and it always will be, and don't let a doubt enter your mind. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Nina Samosco. Hello. Hey, Nina. How's it going? It's going pretty good. How are you doing? I'm okay in these times, as best as I can be. <laughs> yeah, oh, what a clusterfuck we're in, huh? <laughs> crazy time, crazy time. Are you recording already? Yep. Right on. Yes, it's it's such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Well, thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. So, going back in time, uh, did you gravitate toward acting early on? I always loved it. I I didn't I, I don't think I ever didn't do it. Um, um yeah, I've always loved it. Yes, your <laughs> <laughs> your your brother of course is Casey Samosco from so many classic eighties movies like Back to the Future, Three O'Clock High, Stand By Me, Secret Admirer, Biloxi Blues. And uh, a very underrated movie called Breaking In. Oh, such a good movie. Yeah. Yeah, I love that movie. That, that the Reynolds. Yeah, they were really good together in that movie. Yeah, Lorraine Toussaint was in it too. Oh, such a good movie. Um, yeah. Yeah, good actor, huh? Yeah. <laughs> how How is he doing these days? He's great. He's in New York. He's um, yeah, he's living the life. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was trying to search for him not too long ago. But, um, and? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you found him nowhere because he's on no social media whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's still that way, I have to say. The people who can do yeah. that, I admire them because I, I – because it's been so ingrained in the culture, I just cannot go without using social media. Oh, my God. I, I would love to not be on social media myself. I, I, it's sometimes I just feel like it's such a chore. Um, I don't have much of a presence on Facebook anymore. I mm. kind of ended that, but then we start, ugh, yeah, <laughs> it's such a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's wild to me to have, you know, I mean, a lot of people, they just have their whole lives out in public. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know, I just feel like when you're an actor, that's almost a disservice to the public. You know, like, there's a few actors who don't have any social media presence whatsoever, and I really respect that because, you know, they still have the ability of creating character without people going, hey, wait a minute, they were at that club last week, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And also, too, you know, if uh, acting rules are sparse, they, this is their way of saying Look at me, I'm acting and not getting paid for it. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I don't. Um, explain what you mean. You know, like, okay, um, 
they you know make it look like uh, that their lives are are perfect by posting these pictures of them out in public smiling having a good time you know but they're just like anybody else they're 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 going through some shit like everyone is yeah yeah social media we have all realized is a curated version of our lives it's the uh version of our lives we wish we had yes (laughs) (laughs) you know um you know some people are a little more um honest about their lives but i mean overall we're trying to you know put a picture with the best angle to make us look skinny and you know to make us look you know strong or to make us you know look more handsome or more beautiful or you know Mm -hmm. better lighting (laughs) (laughs) you know um yeah it's a curated version of us uh i always think it's really interesting when you see someone in public that you you know, have been conversing with online, you maybe have never even met them, and you meet them, and you're like, uh, that's not who I thought that was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't, look, they don't look like what they look like online, you know? Yeah. That's always interesting. So. I totally agree, yeah. So, you're born and raised in Chicago? I am. I am born and raised in Chicago. I lived there for the first 18 years of my life. I still feel very much like a Chicago girl, even though, I mean, I'm, I'm, well, I'm definitely an LA girl. I've been here for most of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I'm definitely, but you can't, you can't ever let go of the Chicago roots. I mean, you can hear it in my voice. When I get tired, I definitely sound like I'm from the north side of Chicago. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's home, you know, it's still my dearest friends go there, my, you know, my friends that I've had my whole life. Um, you know, other ones have, you know, spread out across the country and across the world. But, um, yeah, some of my dearest friends go with there. Yeah, it's on my list someday to go. Uh, my grandparents uh, were, from, were from there, or at least my grandpa mm-hmm. was. And uh, my dad was the first one uh, to be born in California. Oh, we're right on. Yeah. My aunt, my and my three oldest uncles, they were all born in Chicago, and so he was the first one to be born in California, and then my uncle after that. So, yeah, someday I'll go there. Right on. Where are you located now? Uh, at the moment, I'm living in uh, Redding, California, but I'm originally from San Francisco. Right on. I I love um, San Francisco so much. I was just up there for a week the first week of March. Really? Um, it's one of my favorite parts of, of California. I, I loved it years ago, and now it's just not my favorite place anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, it's, it's definitely more interesting a few years ago. This last time that I went, it, um, obviously with what's going on in the world, um, was definitely showing its way in the city, but even prior to that, um, the city's changed a lot. <laughs> Like, very strange. Very strange, yeah. I was reading, um, you graduated from the Goodman School of Drama at DePaul University. I did not, actually. Oh, that's an IMDb flubber, then? You know, there's a lot of missed things. Yeah, there's a lot of things on there that are not true. And that is one of them. I did not graduate from um, the Goodman School of Drama or the theater school. Um, I just went for a year. That's all I did. Okay. One year. Yep. One year, and uh, it was an awesome year. And uh, my acting teacher, I don't know why I keep forgetting his name, because I love this guy so much. Hold on. <laughs> no, I'll tell you. I, I will remember his name in a moment. But um, he used to say to me, I'm sorry for the background noise there. Okay. He used to say to me, why are you here? And I'd say, well, because I'm trying to learn... Um, I want to learn method and I want to learn technique. And he'd say, but you have your own method. You have your own technique. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, so I, I went for a year and honestly, I thought that as an actor, I needed to get that, you know, diploma underneath my belt. And mm-hmm. nope, didn't need to. Um, didn't need to. Yeah. What, 
was uh, Jillian Anderson one of your classmates? Rick Murphy. Rick Murphy. That was the teacher's name. Rick Murphy. Really great guy. Rick Murphy. Rick Murphy. Rick Murphy. Um, Jillian was a year, I think, ahead of me. Yeah. She was a year ahead of me. Yeah, I had a crush on her growing up. I heard, though, that she was kind of a diva. Was she? Uh, not that I recall. No. Oh. I thought she was pretty cool. Pretty cool. She she was, you know, she was really adept at acting. Mm-hmm. My dog is giving me a hard time here. Um, <laughs> yeah, she was really adept at acting. She was really cool. She was a cool chick. Yeah. Oh, good. Was yeah. I experienced with her. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. How did you get yeah. how did you get cast in one more Saturday night? I auditioned. Mm-hmm. Um, they came to Chicago. Uh, they were hiring locally because they needed, I guess, you know, financially for the for the bottom line of the movie. And I just auditioned and I got it. Unbelievably. And that was the start of everything. That was the real start of everything for me. You yeah. know, shooting a movie. It was really really cool to be able to do that. I mean, I remember how excited I was. I showed up on set the first day with a bag lunch, not knowing that there was going to be food served. (laughs) We didn't know. I didn't know. My parents didn't know. We didn't know what to expect. Um, I was up all day. I was so excited. And then I got my call time and it was at like 5 p.m. And we worked till, you know, the following morning. It was night shoot the whole time. But I was so excited that first day that I woke up early in the morning, like ready to go at 5 p.m. <laughs> ready all day. Oh, by the end of that night, I was so tired. Yeah. It was an awesome, awesome experience, my first um, movie. It, it's really kind of cool because there's a lot of really neat people that were in that movie. Um, John Cameron Mitchell was in it. Mm-hmm. He played like as a party goer at this party that I was at in the movie. And uh, Steve Pink. John Cameron Mitchell, um, Hedwig, the Angry Inch. Yeah. Know that? Yeah. Um, and Steve Pink is a, a producer who... Um, oh, John Cusack's was, friends. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So there's, there's a lot of really cool people that were a part of that show. Wow. And that's, did you know who Frankie and Davis were yet? Uh, yeah. I mean, I knew that they had worked with Saturday Night Live. Mm-hmm. Were I mean they were like a writing team from from like the greatest TV show in my opinion at the time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was really cool to be able to meet them and and see them. I didn't actually get to work with them. I, I shot one scene with them, just one scene. But um, the rest of the time, I was with um, God. What is the kid's name? His name was Frank. I can't remember his last name. Anyway, um, yeah, for the rest of the time, I just had this crew that I worked with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Meshach Taylor. Meshach Taylor. Oh, yeah. Meshach Taylor. <laughs> yeah, he played the father. Um, I was babysitting his kid. That was neat. Yeah. I, this movie used to play late at night at Cinemax when I was a kid, and now, like, no one's ever even heard of it. It's, it's so wow. Weird. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't even know if you can get a copy of it anywhere. Like, anywhere. eBay, probably. Maybe. Um, yeah, I, I, I've only seen it once. Mm-hmm. Just once. <laughs> yeah, I can't, rem- I can't even remember the last time I saw it. It's been so long. <laughs> Maybe 20 years, at least. Well, I can't believe you saw it at Cinemax. That's so funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to play all the time. <laughs> really? Yeah. No. Maybe that's how they made their money back. Huh? Oh, yeah. The power of cable and VHS back in those days was just I know, mighty. right? It was mighty. Yeah. Um, I mean, it hurt a lot of people's uh, pockets who were involved because they only got like 10 cents, you know, for residuals or whatever. But it, it cult success was, was prevalent back then. And then now, of course, you know, we have the conventions and everything and people, you know, make money off of their likeness at conventions and stuff. Yeah. 
I've never done conventions. I've been asked to. I just, um, I haven't done them. Well, if you have, have you gone to conventions? What are those like? Oh, I've gone to many the last four years. They are a lot of fun. Um, really? Yeah. I, I do have to tell you, though, the last year or so, I've noticed a, a change in them, though. Uh, promoters, I, I, I guess it's promoters that are that are the reason for this. A lot of um, celebrities you meet at, at conventions, they rush a lot of fans, and they're not very talkative these days. And before, it used to be the ones who were like, you know, super famous and they had reputations for being divas. Now a lot of them are doing it. I think uh, because it could be the, the promoters or it could also be just for the fact that uh, lines have gotten longer, you know, but it, it, it's, 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 it's a really weird time for conventions. And of course, you know, with this coronavirus and everything, they're all being canceled the next few months. Right. Right. Yeah. Canceled. But I do recommend them. They are a lot of fun. And if you uh, got just a big enough following, you make pretty good money in just one weekend doing them. Wow. Yeah. That that sounds like a good deal. <laughs> yeah. I, I I should consider it. <laughs> you should. You should. Yeah, they're they're a lot of fun. Mm. Then comes the role I'll always think of when I think of you, and that's the role of Natalie in License to Drive. Awesome. Yes. Was that uh, just a, another standard audition? Yeah. I, I I had just shot, I was shooting actually Tucker at the time. Mm-hmm. And I flew to Los Angeles for the audition. Um, I think I auditioned for a couple of different things. Um, for Zuzu Petal. In uh, Fort Fairlane? Yes. I, I know Maddie Corman, yes. I know, that's why I brought it up. <laughs> and then I auditioned for this, um, and I got this one. Maddie got that one. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I met the director, and I remember, I don't know why in the audition, but I said this guy, I must have talked to you soon. Like, I said that as I was leaving the audition, like, see you soon. And mm-hmm. he was like, what? Like, he couldn't believe that I was so, like, oh, like, I got the job. But that's not what I meant when I was leaving the room. I just said it because we had so much fun. I was like, oh, I hope I get to see him soon, which mm. I ended up getting to see him soon because I got the job. But it was just like, <laughs> it was one of those funny things that we later recounted. You know, Greg Beeman and I said, did you realize that you said I'll see you soon? And I was like, no, I, I, I don't remember that. I guess I just had a good time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I loved working with him. He was a super cool dude, Greg Seaman, and we actually became friends, and um, I've seen him over the years. I loved him. Good, good man. Oh, him and the writer Neil Token did a hilarious commentary track for the DVD of the movie, which I have, and I just crack up every time I listen to it. I, I listen to it more than actually watching the movie without the commentary because it's so entertaining. I remember um, there was that scene where... Um, uh, the two Corys are in the car with Corey Feldman's mother uh, driving them to the party. And then there's that group of assholes. They're all like, hey, dweebs, do your mamas hold your dicks when you piss? Right? <laughs> and um, uh, Greg says to Neil, he says, wow, Neil, that's very thought-provoking. Did you get Did you get that from Proust? <laughs> <laughs> I crack up every time I hear that. <laughs> I have... I- the movie I don't think I've ever seen that movie actually I don't usually see stuff that I'm in after seeing my first movie ever I kind of decided like I would buy a ticket like if it's a film I'll go the opening night and buy some tickets to the yeah. film just to be supportive of the film and to support me you know like that's what you do but I never actually I try not to see the movies I saw Tucker one mm-hmm. we they have this big Screening in San Francisco. My girlfriend Andrea and I flew to San Francisco together, um, and uh, we went to that screening. And they did a double screening. It was Willow and Oh yeah, uh, and Tucker at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, George Lucas. He produced both of those movies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I love the character of Natalie because. 
you know, she's she's very uh, political. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know. Yes, she is. What? Well, well, my boyfriend, played by Grant Heslov, <laughs> is a huge producer now. Yep. Yeah. Grant yeah. Was great. Yeah, was he great to work with? Awesome. So much fun. Very serious. We were both very serious. Very serious actors. Scientists, you know, create, you know, art. <laughs> yeah. We were very serious. <laughs> when, yeah, when I saw him go up on stage at the Academy Awards with George Clooney, you know, six, seven years ago, whatever it was, I was I was just like, he's still Carl to me. I'm like, look, it's Carl. <laughs> yeah. 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 How how was working with the two Corys? Uh, I, you know, I think I was a bit of a method actress at that point in my life. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they were cool. You know, I was a teenager. I didn't really like them. Mm-hmm. You know, two boys who were, they were annoying to me. Um, <laughs> you know, I've since, uh, you know, obviously, it was just the timing. Um, I remember we used to have to go do school together, um, school on set, because we were all underage. And um, I don't know, we must have gotten into some kind of something or other. They were being annoying, and I said something. And then I'll never forget, um, Corey Feldman said, oh, you're so much like Martha. And... <laughs> And I remember, like, and I looked back and I said, well, Martha must be really cool. And it was Martha Plimpton. And I was like, oh, yeah, she's really cool. (laughs) (laughs) That was the, you know, like, that was, we we definitely did. Truth be known, we did not get along very well. Although I did end up selling my scooter. Mm -hmm. I had this scooter that I purchased. Um, It was how I got around L.A., after doing Tucker, and I still didn't have a driver's license, so I was driving around Los Angeles mm-hmm. on a scooter, this Yamaha scooter, and um, yeah, so I ended up selling that to Feldman. He promptly crashed it, but <laughs> my scooter. I don't know why I'm telling you that, but there it is, <laughs> a little behind the scenes. So you, so you, you were acting when when Corey burps into the intercom. <laughs> I just saw the documentary. Did you see it? Of? Of uh, 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 that Corey Feldman released that documentary about um, pedophilia in Hollywood. I have not seen it. Yeah, it's it's basically a rehash of stuff that's already been that he's already said in like talk show interviews and stuff. It it wasn't as as you know it didn't live up to the hype really. Mm-hmm. But. Well, yeah, how how was uh, having Richard Mazur and uh, Carol Kane as parents? I mean, hello, coolest <laughs> thing ever. Richard Mazur, Carol Kane. I mean, Carol Kane's so fucking cool. Mm-hmm. It was rad. It was really rad. I've had some cool moms over the years. I have to say, you know. Yeah. Dr. Channing was also my mom. Joan Allen was my mom. I mean, you know, I got some good moms. Yeah. And the and, uh, the ending was a reshoot. It was. I have. I was wearing a wig. <laughs> you cut your hair. Because yeah, because I had chopped my hair off for this movie that I did with Hugh Hudson. Um, it was called uh, Los Angels. Um, but they what, what did no what it was it originally called? It was called something else, and then it was called Los Angels. Um, mm-hmm. I had shaved my head off, hair off, and I had really short blonde hair for that. So they had to wake me up for that reshoot. Wow, it was pretty convincing. Yeah, really convincing. Um, I also had to wake up for the reshoot of Airhead. Oh yeah. <laughs> I also had to cut off my hair for another project. Um, so thank God my hair grows fast. 
the movie was originally called The Road Home. Uh, Airhead? No, no, no. Um, Lost Angels. No, I think it was called something else. Oh, because I, I looked it up. It said it was also known as The Road Home. Or maybe that was like a VHS title or something. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. But, uh... Anyway. So, with um, Tucker, um, how was that experience? Well, that was before a License to Drive. Right. It was incredible. It was my second movie. And, you know, I often have said everything went downhill from there. I mean, I was working with the best. Um, Vittorio Storaro shot me. I mean, come on. It was, it was an incredible experience. It was like two and a half months. San Francisco. Loved it. Puerto Madera. We shot all over San Francisco and um, the surrounding areas, Oakland. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it was really cool. Uh, What a great group of actors that he brought together for it. I mean, everybody in it was special, special, well cast. Um, Fred Ruse cast that, really famous casting agent. Um, Well respected, well regarded. Yeah, it was really cool. I mean, I the fact that I got cast in it is kind of crazy because I was living in Chicago. Mm-hmm. You know, I had just gotten kicked out of high school. And <laughs> um, I just got offered a part in Poltergeist 3 with Lara Flynn Boyle mm-hmm. um, and other local uh, Chicago actors. And... Um, and my brother had just worked on Gardens of Stone with Fred Ruse with Francis Coppola. Oh, that's right. And, yeah. Yeah. And so I don't know how it came up, but I guess my brother heard about this. He said, you should have my sister come in. And so then I flew out and then I read and then I, you know, I, well, I put myself on tape in Chicago. Then I flew out and I read and it, it was just one of those, you know, it was meant to be moments. You know, I, I was at the right place at the right time. The right person said the right thing. Uh, I was prepared. Everything was just like a, the confluence of all of these different things came together, and um, I got the job. Wow. That was, it was kind of really cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just remember, you know, I got kicked out of high school, and <laughs> I was now starting at a new high school, and I, I was really sort of like, is that all there is? Like, I knew that my life, this, this was not my life. I didn't feel like this was my life. Something mm-hmm. needed to change, and I, I think I just wished it into existence. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and then I was off to the races. I didn't come home for like two years straight. Wow. Yeah, um, during that time, uh, movies about car moguls were being made, but they were mostly for television. But because Francis Coppola was Francis Coppola, he was able to make one that was theatrical. Right. Yeah. Jeff Bridges, he's one of my favorites. He's such a great actor. Such a cool dude. Wow. Yeah, he, he's known, I, don't, I think he released a book. Um, he would take photographs on the set. And at the end of production, he would present everyone from the production with a book of photographs that mm-hmm. he took. And I still have it. It's really cool. It's all of these pictures of behind the scenes or in the middle of scenes. And he had this old school camera that, you know, you would, it would, I guess the, the, the way it would shoot was you had enough time to be in one side of the film and then run over and do something different so that when you, um, when you develop the film, you would be in two places at once. So I guess the, 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 I don't, I don't don't really know cameras very well, but Mm -hmm. it was the lens or the stop or I don't know. Anyway, but there are all these great photographs of of us, you know, being on one side of the camera and then the other making faces and it's just really cool. Yeah. He would give us everyone and he's, I guess he did that, you know, every movie he's ever done, he's done that. He's, you know, giving people a book of photographs, which is really neat. 
Yeah, he, I've heard he's a very nice guy. Oh my god. Like, oh my god. I didn't really know that much about him when I got to do the movie, and I showed up on set, and I just remember thinking, who is that beautiful man? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, you know, 16 at the time, and I just was, oh my god, who is that? I mean, <laughs> He was so beautiful. I, like, for the first week, I couldn't really even go near him. Yeah. He was so pretty to me. So pretty. <laughs> That's awesome. And then um, you were on Lonesome Dove. Have any good stories about that? Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, I got to hang out with... Um... <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I got the job, and all I wanted to do was um, ride horses and spend time with one actor. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to ask you, who is that actor? I'm guessing it's Robert Duvall. Yes! <laughs> He's one of the greats. <laughs> oh my god. All I, I just couldn't wait to hang out with him. Like I just was, I decided that I was going to spend time with him. I also, um, guess who else I worked with on that? Well, I did, we didn't work through together directly, but it was the first time we met, and then we ended up doing several projects together after that. Hmm. Who? No, I'm going to ask. You have to figure it out. Uh, I'm trying to think. Have you worked with Tommy Lee Jones again? Nope. Uh, Diane Lane? Nope, but I love her. Yeah, I do too. Uh, Angelica Houston? Love her. Nope. I didn't actually get to meet her or work with her on that. Danny Glover. I okay, well there's one. <laughs> I worked with him twice. And there's someone else. We did airheads together. I'm giving you more hints. Uh shoot, let me look here. And Reservoir Dogs. Now I'm really telling you who it is. Steve Buscemi? Steve Buscemi. Steve Buscemi. <laughs> I met him on that. He was amazing. I loved him so much. I mean, his he was dating his wife at that time, and then they got married. So that was I. I knew them before they were married. Uh, I, I didn't even yeah. know he was in Lonesome Dove. It's been a long time since yeah. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, and Rick Schroeder was in it, who I adored. Um, such a good guy. Yeah, I so I was so excited to hang out with Robert Duvall. That was just like the best. I get to work with Barry Corbin, who was awesome. And then there was one other actor that I worked with several times over the years who I worked with directly on this show. Well, actually, there's two more actors. Um, Freddie Forrest, Mm -hmm. who was in He Got to Kill Me because he played Blue Duck. He was in Tucker. one more person, which I'm going to make you figure it out. (laughs) And we'll come back to it later because he's an incredible actor and he's been in everything. And... Uh, I'm going to give you a hint. It okay. was a money train. <laughs> I do like obscure movies. <laughs> but I don't know if you like obscure 90s movies. Some, I do. There were. Yeah. Uh, um, money train. He played the bad guy in Money Train. Robert Blake? Nope. Who was also a bad guy in Money Train. But this was a really, really bad guy in Money Train. Uh, let me think. Let me think here. Uh, Barry Tubb? I'm making you do this. Your listeners are going to be like, why would you keep asking me in questions? Uh, B- Barry Tubb? No. I give up. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We're going to come back to it later. Okay. Okay. All I have to say is American Beauty, and then you'll get it. Kevin Spacey? Nope. Okay, we'll come back to it. All right. And then uh, you did Little Noises. Yeah. Yeah. I interviewed. That was fun. I interviewed an actress that was in the movie, uh, Kathy Haas, who played Eve. Mm-hmm. She's a very interesting lady, say the least. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. How was Tatum O'Neill? Tatum's great. Such a sweetheart. Mm-hmm. 
And yeah, Chris, Crispin Glover. And Crispin Glover. Crispin is so amazing. Such an interesting fella. He really wanted me to beat him up. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. It's pretty funny. I love Jane, Jane the director. She's really cool. And one of my dearest friends is um, was in that movie. Steven Shoup. Oh, yeah. Who is such a good actor. Dear friend. Love him. Yeah. Steve Shoup. Mm-hmm. And then you finally got to play the lead in Wild Orchid 2. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I used to watch this movie on USA Up All Night when I was a kid. Wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have any reservations about playing this character? Uh, not in the original script form, no. Uh, I did when I do, even now. I don't really talk about it that much. I met some incredible people on the show that I'm still friends with. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was really not happy with the change of the title and um, what it ended up being because that's not what I thought we were shooting. It was called Blue Movie Blue. It was a really cool script, Um, really beautiful script, actually, about this girl, and then it ended up being something quite different. That was a really interesting experience to to see that happen, Mm -hmm. to see, you know, wow, you know, I knew very early on that the actor really has no control over anything other than that space between action and cut. Yeah. Um, but after that, it's out of your hands. And, uh, you know, there you go. It's out of your hands. Ugh, that's terrible. Yeah. Uh, Tom Skerritt, he's my uncle's uh, neighbor um, in Washington. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And another guest of mine who was in that was uh, Leanne Curtis. Right. Yeah. Leanne. I love Leanne. She's so funny. <laughs> you played um, Mia Farrow in Sinatra. Um, were you the first choice? I don't know. I have no idea. Did you ever hear back uh, from the real Mia Farrow? Never, never. And I, I, I read for it. Tina Sinatra cast me in it. She was producing it. Mm-hmm. I never got to meet him. I love working with the actor who played Sinatra. Um, oh my God, I don't know why his name just escaped me, but there it is. I'll find A really you great actor. You probably know better than I do. You're probably Phil, making it a list. Philip Kasnoff. Yeah, Phil Kasnoff. So yeah. great. What a, he did such a beautiful job in that part. Um, yeah, I mean, it was really, that was one of the very few times in my life where I played someone, I actually think it's the only time in my life that I played someone that was famous, that was in the public eye that, that people knew. And, um, you know, how do you, how do you do that? How do you do that and, you know, be respectful? And I remember just really wanting to be respectful. <laughs> um, and yet also just play the part that's written on the page. So I think I, I think I, I achieved that maybe. Yeah. I mean, at that time too, you know, she was going through the whole thing with Woody Allen you know, I'm sure if she if she did know about your performance and stuff, you know, it's probably just during that time of, you know, vulnerability and stuff, you know. But it would have been nice to, you know, hear if, uh, you know, what she thought about your performance. Um, no, I think I'm actually okay with that, not knowing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with not knowing. <laughs> Uh, it was a really cool experience, though, I have to say. And, you know, again, you know, I honestly, I, I feel pretty fortunate that I've worked with some pretty great people and actors mm-hmm. over the years. I mean, I only, I think I only have a handful of times where I was like, mm, not my favorite. But overall, like, I've been 
pretty lucky. You know, I've been um, protected from the gods, um, from experiences that could have been really negative, um, negative working experiences. I've had really positive ones. And even with the ones where I, I um, maybe didn't get along with the other actor or something, you know, it always ended up being something that worked itself out, you know? Mm-hmm. Pretty fortunate. So you had a scene that was cut from Reservoir Dogs. How, how did how did that uh, movie come about for you? I met Quentin at Sundance, the summer program. He was uh, workshopping Reservoir Dogs there, and we just hit it off. I really liked him. He liked me, and he just said, "I want you to be in my movie." And I was I was like, "Okay, but this, this is a, a news movie." And he's like, "No, no, no, come do it. Come do it. It'll be great." It'll be I mean, his dialogue is so rich and so poetic, you know, it's hard yeah. to memorize all that stuff because he's, he's a wordsman. Well, you know, what's funny is that I could remember the feeling and the story, but it was the ifs, ands, or buts. There was a certain cadence that he had in that movie that for some reason I couldn't wrap. I, I, it didn't make, like, I couldn't grasp it. And that's, that's on me, not on him. You know, he, exactly. He's a wordsmith. Um, yeah. So, but we got it. We got it in the can. Thank God it happened. We got it. And, yeah, and they cut it out. <laughs> I remember showing up and, and him telling me, coming up to me and telling me, I can't remember if he told me or if, <sighs> who told me? I think he did. Oh, well, I just want to let you know that you're not in the movie. He was the producer. Um, we were Storm Thunder, but mm-hmm. I was bummed. I was really bummed. I was um, being cut out. Well, the movie. Well, the legendary character actor Dick Miller was cut from Pulp Fiction, and uh, Quentin forgot to tell him, and so he showed up to the premiere thinking he was in the movie. And his wife told me uh, she, uh, he never forgave Quentin for that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I showed up to the premiere, and they told me as I was walking into the movie. So I was a little like, uh, I remember, like, what? Um, he was like, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an odd feeling, you know, to, to come in and know that you worked on something and it's no longer there. But I thought it was really sweet that he put it in the deleted scenes. That was very sweet of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good little scene. Yeah. I, I have to say, I love Quentin as a human being. He's such a kind, kind soul. He like, came to all my birthday parties in my 20s. <laughs> oh, that's um, really nice. Yeah, he's such a good man. Good man. So. Oh. You, you did um, an episode of Tales from the Crypt, Creep Course. Yeah, fun. We kept on patting my bra for that. <laughs> <laughs> the final costume, my boobs were like 10, 50 times bigger than what they are. It was fun. Yeah. Uh, the late Jeffrey Bohm uh, wrote and directed. What was he like? He was great. You know, he also wrote Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. And he also wrote uh, Inner Space. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, he was cool. And, and, you know, it was just so fun to do one of those. I've never, you know, it, you know it, it, it's it's like a fun thing to have been a part of. 
um, super fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had two John Hughes legends, Jeffrey Jones and Anthony Michael Hall. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to meet Anthony Michael Hall. He was going to be at the uh, horror convention Monster Palooza in May in Pasadena, and I'm not going to meet him. I'm so devastated. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting how all of that shakes out, you know, with the coronavirus, what ends up happening for us, how long we'll be down, how long. I mean, I, I'm still very much... I wish I bought stock in Zoom because I've been on that for hours and hours and hours on end since this started. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so, yeah, I, I hope that they um, can restart the thing sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. For everybody. I hope so, too. You got any good stories about Airheads? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had the best line in the movie, and it wasn't in the script, I think. Um, I, you know, it was just another, it was a night shoot, mm -hmm. all night, in the summer of, I think it was 1994, and... Um, 94. 93 or 94? Yeah, somewhere 93. there. 93, 1993. Yeah. And, you know, I got to work with Amy Wilson. Again, we worked together on Los Angeles, and Brendan and I did this movie called um, 20 Bucks. I met him then. I mm -hmm. love Brendan. And then, you know, I got to work with Steve Buscemi again, and um, and then, you know, meeting Adam Sandler, he was really cool and funny, and um, Chris Farley and Michael Richards. I mean, I, everybody on this. Again, what a cool cast, like well-rounded, fun, super cool cast, down to, you know, um, Alexis Arquette and... Um, Joe Mantegna. Joe Mantegna and um, Reggie Cassie and, oh, what's her name, um, Michelle First, who has just was just on Orange is the New Black. Mm -hmm. um, so really... All the parts, everybody was so special and so unique and um, talented. You know, I, Amy and I, I feel like we grew up together, so it was so nice to see her again and get to, like, hang out with her on this movie as well. Um, because we just, we had just spent, you know, several, five years earlier, you know, a whole bunch of months together in Austin, Texas. You know, her mom, my mom, together, you know, doing school on set, and um, here we were again now, like, you know, kind of semi-grown-ups. So, um, yeah, it's fun. We had a really good time on the show, you know, yeah. halfway pulling pranks on each other, stealing the golf carts on the uh, box lot at, the, at a time when you could still steal a golf cart or steal a bicycle. Um, I, I found a cat on the set and brought it home. Yeah, yeah. And, and Michael Lehman directed. He he also directed the Heather's and um, mm -hmm. Hudson Hawk with Bruce Willis. Yeah, was he yeah. Good, was he good to work with? Great, had a massive crush on him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I loved him, loved him. Um, yeah, super fun. You know, he like just let us go, let us do our thing, and um, he really trusted that we would all show up and be prepared to do. Thing. Yeah, that's good. I noticed uh, you worked with Aaron Sorkin. Hold on one second. Wait, wait, oh, one second, because there's a crazy sound. Wow. Huh. That's strange. Okay. I, was, I, I noticed you worked with Aaron Sorkin on a couple of things, the American president and the West Wing. I mean, how, good, how big of a genius is he? I mean, I, I, I guess he's pretty big. Everybody says he's a genius. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I, I worked with him on American President. Then um, he wrote Sports Night, and I was supposed to test for Sports Night. I ended up doing a different pilot called Astoria. I was really bummed about that 
that because I would have loved to do both, but there it is. And then I ended up doing a little cameo on sports night, which then he handed me the script at West Wing and said, come on in, I want you to do something on the show. And I was like, great. And my father passed away, so I ended up not doing anything on the pilot, mm-hmm. only to um, then come in and audition for the part of Ellie, which was one of those things where I read the script, I read the sides, I literally read the sides, I knew the sides backwards and forwards in less than two minutes. Like, the language fit me. The part fit. It was like a, it was like putting on, you know, those perfect pair of jeans. It was tailor-made. <laughs> that was my part. Yeah. Yeah, they call that tailor-made. I also love um, those uh, those Mystery Woman TV movies you were in. Kelly Martin. They're really good friends. I love Kelly so much. I mean, it's just such a fun thing to be able to go to work with people, you know, with your your best friend, you know, with somebody you love. And uh, we just had a blast. We would giggle a lot. And, and the crew, the same crew, it was great. I, I really enjoyed that gig. It was a really good gig. I've heard rumors of a possible reboot, but it's not confirmed. Really? Yeah. Hmm, I think that would be a maze ball. Yeah. <laughs> let's let us hope that it happens. Yeah, I would I would love that. I you know, like I said, I loved working with her. We had so much fun together. Mm-hmm. Um she's currently working on another show, Haley Dean. Mm-hmm. Um, the Haley Dean Mysteries, but yeah, let's do it again. I think that would be fun. They were just fun, you know, it's like uh what was that TV show with um, that Sunday night TV show? My mom used to watch it, The British Lady. Uh, Murder, oh, she wrote. Murder, she wrote, it was yeah. The modern Murder, she wrote, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they did like, I don't know, 264 episodes, and that means 264 friends of hers died. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't think she's on Facebook. <laughs> But you never know. I mean, you never know. Some people you, you'd never expect will be on social media. You know, Alan Alda's on social media, so go figure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Carl Reiner, he's a too. Big social media guy. It's huge. <laughs> oh, yeah. Carl Reiner, he's 98 and he's on social media. Love it. Every day he's, he's writing something about Trump and his mind is still sharp at, the, at 98. It's amazing. It's so amazing. Now, so funny. now you were um, diagnosed with lupus when? Um, ten years ago. Ten years ago. Yeah. Did you just start feeling sick and you went to the doctor and found out? Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's been a. It's, I'm. I feel pretty fortunate because I don't. Um, I don't have severe case. I mean, obviously the people around me would say, shut up, but, um, I don't feel like I, I, I really have it under control and I have a protocol and, um, it has not affected me as much as say someone else, but it was definitely one of those things like, oh, that's why it was a real aha when I found out, you know, why it would swell up out of nowhere and, you know. So yeah, so the discovery was a great discovery, and and uh, now I, you know, I manage. I manage. It's it's actually been one of it's been a, a great gift, uh, which you wouldn't think I would look at it that way, but it's been a great gift because it just made me change my lifestyle. Um, and I I'm pretty I'm, I'm, I try to live a very healthy lifestyle. Yeah, I had a car accident five years ago, and it, it changed my lifestyle. I was a yeah. I was a pretty bad alcoholic for a couple of years, and I've been sober five years now. Well, congratulations! That's amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be podcasting and talking to all my favorite movie actors and stuff. Right on, brother. That's amazing. That's amazing. Oh, uh, yes. Um, yeah, amazing. Congratulations. 
Uh, thank you so much. Are there are there days though when you just feel lethargic? Yeah, yeah. There are days where I just have to shut it down. You know, mm-hmm. um, a self-imposed coronavirus, uh, six feet apart from other people. <laughs> shut down. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, as a result, I'm really grateful to my yoga practice. Uh, I think my my yoga practice is why I'm doing way better than I maybe would have been without it. Um, you know, I I started this journey, and uh, it it amplified the journey. And I took a break. I essentially took a break for quite some time from the acting world, and. Um, you know, it's only now that I'm starting to sort of miss it and want to do it again. I really miss it. I feel it's important that I start to do that again. So, you know, sticking my toe in the water, jumping in, now with two feet. But um, this yoga journey that I've been on has been an extraordinary gift as a result of um, that diagnosis. So. Wow. It- do, yeah, I've met some really cool people. I've gone to India a bunch of times, and um, I have had such the privilege of, of working with, you know, this teacher who worked with B- BKS Iyengar, who's this cat named Manuso Manos, who's, like, the coolest dude, Greek guy from Ohio, <laughs> from <laughs> Ohio, who lives in San Francisco. He's the coolest dude. Him and his family are just awesome. Um, so I've had the privilege of, like, you know, working with, you know, some pretty incredible teachers. Um, Claire Hartley, who is uh, in Los Angeles here, she's sort of like, the, she's a teacher's teacher. She's a big secret. Um, I got I got to work with her, and, um, yeah, it's been really cool. Really cool, the yoga journey. Never thought in a million years that I would become a yogi, much less <laughs> teach yoga. And uh, become a vegan. How did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> I'm from Chicago. <laughs> do, do you know Mandy Ingber? Yes, I love Mandy. Yeah. Mandy's the bomb. Yeah. She, yeah, she teaches yoga. And um, I had her on the podcast about a year ago. Oh, my God. She is a trip, I'll tell you. <laughs> She's amazing. She's amazing. Just the, the sweetest, coolest ever yeah mandy and i've known each other for years yeah yeah she's awesome and i see that uh you used to be a a marathon runner and a snowboarder yeah yes on both Mm -hmm. um you still do it snowboarding uh in the 90s and uh i was first skiing then i started snowboarding and then i continued snowboarding into my 30s, and then I caught a toe edge, and I fucking beefed it so hardcore, it was so painful, (laughs) (laughs) it was so hardcore, that I was like, okay, I just sort of have hung up my snowboard for the moment, I just couldn't get back on the slopes after that, it was so painful, I was like playing, I got actually pretty good at it, I was, you know, became a little bit of a shred buddy, I got pretty good. (laughs) <laughs> um, yeah, so, but no more, no more snowboard, no more snowboarding. Um, and yeah, I run a, ran a bunch of marathons and, uh, that too kind of, I went on this yoga journey and I sort of hung up my running shoes, but lately I've been running again and I love it. And again, one of those things, like you never know, you never know what will the ebb and flow be. So I start running again and I'm enjoying it once more. You know, it was very much like or stump, you know, I just was running, <laughs> running, 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 and then all of a sudden I was like, Meh, I'm done. And that was it. <laughs> so now it's, it's come back again, so I've been having fun. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it gets to a, a point, though, you know, where you can't do it, you can't do a certain thing forever and stuff, but you probably miss it a lot, right? Well, you know, I don't know, just to me sometimes, like, you just, I get so into things, and then I'm into them, into them, into them, and then something just kind of goes, 
okay, there's a fork in the road, and then I end up going in this other direction. You know, I, I guess it's kind of like interest. You know, you, you become interested in something, mm -hmm. and you're reading about it, like, incessantly. Like, right now, I'm obsessed with somatics and with, you know, the brain and how the brain tells the body, communicates with the body, and I'm really interested in that. So I'm, like, reading everything I can get my hands on because I'm fascinated with the subject. So I've gone on this journey. And then, you know, something will probably spark an interest there, and then you end up going on another journey of interest, right? Right. I mean, I think that's with anything in life. It is true, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm just obsessed with, you know, the scripts that I write and the comedy that I do and stuff. And I just want to, I want to focus on that. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been trying to move to LA for the last few years, let alone the last 19 years that I've been out of high school. And I just pray to God that, you know, after this virus uh, comes to a halt, you know, it's going to happen for me. Right on, right on. Well, you know, intention, right? Exactly. They say that what you focus on becomes your reality. So I, you're going to move to Los Angeles, and I am going to be able to pull myself up. God damn it, I'm going to do a pull up for real. I'm going to do some serious pull up. Awesome. Without a fist. That's my goal this year. Pull up without a fist. <laughs> I want to be super strong. You can do it. So, I, I believe in you. <laughs> Thanks. Now, um, if you listened uh, to that interview that I sent you and stuff, um, at the end of uh, every episode, I indulge my guest in, in a uh, silly game. Okay. And how this works is it's um, silly slumber party questions. Um, I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the same question and I answer it. Okay. Okay. Nina, are you ticklish? Yes. Are you ticklish? I am baby ticklish. Yes. Um, is your belly button an innie or an Audi? My belly button is an innie. What is your belly button? It's a deep innie. What color are your toenails painted? <laughs> Currently, my toenails are painted a deep, deep blue, like a like a deep blue, like a midnight blue. Pretty. Almost black. Yeah. Are your toenails currently painted? Um, not uh, during this time of year. Uh, last time they were, though, they were um, purple with sparkles. I like to go for elaborate colors. Right on. I dig it. Yeah. Um, what would you say is uh, your best personality trait? I would say my best personality trait is I'm generous. What would you say your best personality trait is? My sense of empathy. Aww. How so? Sorry, that was another question. <laughs> it's okay. I just, you know, I just, I, I've been, I've had a very difficult life and like, Whenever I see someone in a really messed up situation, like, I can always just, you know, relate to them and try to help them if I can. Beautiful. Yes. And then my favorite question. Thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you. And then my favorite question is, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? to that. What is your like stinkiest smell that 
just makes you gag? Um, either farts or feet. Really? Yeah. Um, when I was... You know what's crazy is, um, I can smell things, well, okay, I'm going to add, I'm going to give an addendum to that. Okay. Because I can smell things from miles away. I'm not kidding. I can tell you if someone has, a, needs a root canal from, like, across the room. I can smell that smell from far away. Mm-hmm. I can smell if you've had garlic from far away. Like, literally, I would be able to look around the room and go, that person ate garlic last night. That person didn't floss their teeth. They have stuff between their teeth. I'm not kidding. Like, <laughs> I'm the best person for that. If you want me, it, I would be, like, the person that you should hire if you don't have medical equipment, that equipment that would tell you if there's a, a, <laughs> like a, um, a tooth that needs to be capped or a tooth that needs to be drilled. I'm your person. <laughs> I have the craziest sense of smell. And for good things, too. Like, I can tell you, oh, wow, that person showered and used such and such and such and such. Yeah, we have a, a very sensitive uh, sense of smell in my family, especially on my yeah. mom's side, because we're half Italian. And um, when I was in the hospital, I had really bad athlete's foot after I got out, because... They did not change my socks for the last month I was there because I was so grumpy and I just made them not want to be around me. You know, it was all from the medication and what have you. So for six months, it was pretty bad. And then um, I started soaking my feet and washing them and putting lotion on them. And then it went away. Wow. Cool. Yeah. And I didn't even have a cast on my leg, too, which was which was a good thing. So wait, so you, you wouldn't let people change your socks? You did that on purpose? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, it, just, it didn't come up because I was just really grumpy. I was just like, eh, get out of here or whatever, you know. I just, it, it never came up, to be honest with you. So gotcha. the socks just remained on, yeah. When we took them off, there was all this black crud on my foot, you know. And just it, it was bad. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you were able to you know, take care of those feet. Feet are important. Yeah. Carry us around. People don't realize that. And, you know, I was an athlete in high school. I never got athlete's foot one time. And I always took care of my feet in high school. Right on. Yeah, that was back when they were Mm. pretty. I I hate the way my feet look nowadays. They look really gross to me. (laughs) (laughs) But that's just me. (laughs) We digress. We digress. Well, Nina, this has been an awful lot of fun, and you were just awesome today. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Yes, my pleasure. And I hope you uh, get some acting roles um, soon in the near future after all this crap, you know, has been uh, resolved and that you continue, you. you continue being healthy. Yeah, you too. Stay safe. Stay well. And everyone else around you. Thank you so much. You have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Nina Samosco. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, I enjoy talking to her. She's very funny, very insightful, and very honest, and I love that. She was an amazing guest. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, add me as a friend on Facebook, join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes!